A lot of the 3D printing patents ran out in the mid 2010s. And so then the technology could be maybe not open source, but like copied or imitated. And as you well know, like when more supply or competition enters a market, prices go down, quality goes up. It's becoming cheaper and more accessible. The quality, the reliability is getting better. Um, you see, you see some uh, young people having seven, 10, 20 printers at home, uh, starting their own Etsy store, their own manufacturing. You know, you're a 3D printing industry veteran, um, now creating a deep in for manufacturing, starting with the 3D printing vertical. For our audience or guests that, you know, just don't know much about 3D printing in general, I know I didn't before talking to you, like, where is the industry today? You know, what what's interesting that's going on in terms of technological kind of developments? Like what can be 3D printed? How, how does it apply to people's everyday lives? Good question. So yeah, 3D printing has been around for like 20 years, maybe longer. And it was really kind of reserved for the really high-end industrial purposes. Machines were $200,000, $2 million, and some still are. About 10 years ago, um, MakerBot came out and they open source and they, they look like the first wooden Apple computers. So, you know, the open source community started making these desktop 3D printers and they were very crude and unreliable. But in the last 10 years, the quality has gone up tremendously. Very similar to what we saw with, uh, you know, mainframe computers versus desktops. And now desktops kind of, you can cluster a bunch of desktops and outperform. You've seen that with desk, desktop 3D printers. So, a $600 Bamboo Lab printer from China now uh, can outperform a $200,000 printer from like 10, 15 years ago. So the quality is wow. getting better and better. The um, the costs are going down. And so we're starting to see people cluster these machines. So they're making, you know, anything from, you know, dust buster attachments to medical attachments. Um, you see them in the dentist office now, desktop printers. Um, and now metal printers are becoming inexpensive. You, know, you can get a metal printer for like $10,000. So the, the technology is accelerating, uh, kind of give you a trajectory. You know, there's about 2 million printers made today. There'll be about 22 million made per year, and most of them will be desktops. So it's, it's really starting to rocket, um, and the quality is really getting extraordinary. I mean, full color. We have full color printers now. Right. And yeah, the kind of driving force behind all of those improvements on cost, improvements on quality, I think the way you described it to me as like, basically a lot of the 3D printing patents ran out in the mid 2010s. And so then the technology could be maybe not open source, but like copied or imitated. And as you well know, like when more supply or competition enters a market, Prices go down, quality goes up. So in your mind, is that kind of like the the why now or like the biggest tailwind for 3D printing is literally just patents expired, tech gets commoditized, quality goes up, costs go down. Is that kind of the the story in your mind? Yeah, I think that that definitely triggered. That definitely triggered the competition. And, you know, up till then you had two big companies, uh, Stratasys and uh, 3D Systems. Um, Stratasys predominantly had this, what we call FDM or FF technology, which is like filament. It's like a hot glue gun and it builds objects. Um, and um, 3D Systems had liquid polymer. Basically, it's like liquid. You shine laser or an LCD and it creates a, a structure. Um, yeah, so once the patents expired, you saw new competitors like Formlabs, you know. Um, they came out and they're a startup and they they sold out in Kickstarter. Um, that's part of it. But the really thing is um, that it's becoming cheaper and more accessible. The quality, the reliability is getting better. Um, you see, you see some uh, young people having seven, 10, 20 printers at home, uh, starting their own Etsy store, their own right. manufacturing, and so they don't know how to predict. Like, do I need to make a hundred of these or ten of these? So it's it's opening up new business opportunities. Most of these AI robotic companies or robotic companies, they're three D printing. Um, you see a three D printer almost everywhere in every type of you know IoT. Um, you know, engineering facility, whether it's Ford or a startup. So it's, it's really become prolific. And as the printers get better and better and better and the quality goes up, now you're starting to see low end production. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's one guy who has a thousand printers in Ohio and, um, you know, you usually have to injection mold, you spend a lot more. So you can just 
literally send a thousand parts. If it takes an hour, you can do a thousand parts an hour of, of some small basic parts. You're seeing them on Navy ships. You know, something as simple as a door handle falls off. Um, you take that for granted, but how else are you going to grab the door? So all these little uh, widgets and gadgets um, are starting to be 3D printed at scale. For sure. No, super cool to hear about. I think we've talked about this idea a few times, but I want to get your take live on it, which is, you know, why do you think the world needs to return to a place where kind of economic value is based on goods and services being produced and then sold versus kind of like this you know, financial engineering that often goes on in Wall Street? Like, you know, yeah, why do you want the world to return to a place like that? Well, I think it's the foundation of money, right? If people stop making stuff, there's no stuff. If there's no stuff, there's no money. There's no banks. There's no Wall Street. So trying to preserve the wealth of people that are productive in society, I think, is crucial. It doesn't make sense why a guy trading corn at Wall Street makes more than the guy actually making the corn, does sure. it? Yeah. So I think this is where... Um, the democratization of finance, of, of, of manufacturing, uh, and Deepin really can play an essential role to restore that balance. Um, in terms of you and 3DOS, you guys recently raised a round, selected a layer one blockchain to build on, and are now kind of heads down building out the product, building out the tech. You know, what advice would you have for other Deepin founders that need to raise and need to choose a chain to launch on. So in terms of both of those kind of questions, like how do I raise, who should I raise from, and also what things should I be thinking about when selecting a blockchain for my token to live on? Yeah, I mean, it all comes back to people. Uh, you wanna make sure that you raise from people that align with your vision. Um, and, you know, it's not easy. Raising money is not easy, it's a hustle, right? You're, you're, you're contacting thousands of people, hundreds of meetings, you're improving your pitch, you're, you're, you're you're constantly, um, you're constantly trying to improve not only your pitch but the investors and the, and and the people that you're you're aligning with is very important. I think that's number one. Um, in terms of blockchain, you know, um, I think some people say that's really important. I think I think it's less important. It's it's more about the people. Um, so we partnered with Sui, great team. Um, they have this ZK login, which makes it easy. And I think that's the probably number one thing from a um, UI experience is that you, it's gotta be one or two clicks to get to the product and start using it. So once you have a wallet that you need to connect, a lot of people just blank out, especially manufacturing. They have a company email, they have a Gmail account. And so um, last week we've opened up with Sui the Gmail access. And as soon as you log in with any of your Gmail accounts, business or personal, it creates a wallet in milliseconds. That's awesome. With zero knowledge proof, which is amazing, right? And I think uh, you've heard from uh, Base as well, like that's that's also what they're focused on or making it super easy. So I think to bring on the next billion users, you need to make it super easy. And then with investors, you need to align, they need to align with your vision, right? And uh, you need to keep keep plugging away at it. I mean, Deepin wasn't a thing two years ago, three years ago. They thought it was crazy. Like, right. what is this Deepin? Like, why yeah. don't you create, you know, some <laughs> meme coin? And I was like, no, this is the future, real work. People producing real product, service, and goods around the world, I think, is the future of blockchain. For sure. Tell me about the digital nomad lifestyle. You're, you're one of the founders I know that travels around a lot. And I think, you know, gets a lot of kind of creativity and networking benefits from working in different places, different times of the year. So, yeah, talk to me a bit about, you know, what that looks like for you, why you do it. Um, yeah, just what, what the benefits are of. Yeah, so I've been doing it for a long time. Um, it's almost 15, 20 years, maybe. Um, before I worked at, you know, Dell Computers when I was in my 20s. Um, I worked in a startup in my 20s. And everything was centralized. And, um, and you know, one thing I learned at Dell is you can't manage what you can't measure. So a lot of people get, you know, huge office space, cram a bunch of people in there. And you wonder what, what half the people are doing there. A lot of times they can't measure it. And so one thing that we've been very... Um, efficient on is measuring. So all my developers, they report hours. We have very tasks. We look at like ROI on tasks. We prioritize and um, we're neutral, right? We can hire people anywhere, you know, even with our blockchain um, architect, I, I interviewed like 18 people and ended up finding someone through Fiverr and he smoked basically all my other developers I interviewed that were supposedly from really big companies. So 
it was just about being able to measure um, and and having the flexibility to work different hours, different time zones. You know, this is what decentralization, right? We're neutral to that. As long as you can perform, I don't care if you do it from a cave or a yacht. Um, you know, the performance is is measured every day, and and that's how we that's how we move forward. And we're a very efficient team, for sure. And I guess just last question at a high level. What is the vision for three DOS? You know, reducing latency between, I think, design and manufacturing was a previous company, three D Printer OS, that you're still involved with. What's the vision for for three DOS? Yeah. So when it started um, with three D Printer OS, the vision was how to reduce the latency between design and manufacturing, and three D printers were there. So, you know, whether it's Facebook, uh, Google, um, you know, universities like MIT, Harvard. You know, students would have to go use these machines, like cappuccino machines. They wouldn't know how to use them. And I was like, let's reduce the latency. It needs to be like a uh, using a web server, right? We've got a web browser. You upload your design. Uh, we hacked into all these machines. They were not even online. Put web cameras. So we made it really easy and accessible. And democ- you know, democratized manufacturing. So seven thousand students at Duke can just pl- click a button and print. So that was like the first chapter. And three D printing was aligned with that vision, right? It's it's like probably the most inexpensive. Um, easily accessible technology. Like if I send you to like a wood shop with all these saws and uh, you probably wouldn't know how to use it, you might cut your finger off, right? Yeah. But, but any kid can download an iPhone case and print it. Um, so that was the first vision. And we always wanted to decentralize and I was looking for the right technology because part of being efficient is I don't want to hire thousands of employees in the middle, like a bank, right? What does USDC do? You can instantly send money anywhere in the world and with 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 Deepin and the way we're developing the smart contract is I want to be able to, in a trusted way, or trustless way, be able to send jobs to people that are high performing, high performing nodes. So now the now the vision is, you know, how do we go from manufacturing global distribution, right? And um, manufacturing will still be our core focus, is kind of peeling the onion back. We'll start with 3D printing, then CNC. But really, if you look at the DNA of what that is, it can be any capacity to do work. I'm getting a lot of requests now for people that can do CAD design because hmm. it complements 3D printing. Yeah. So that's a human resource that complements the process that we can outsource and decentralize as well. So for sure. the things we learn from this, you know, it's like Amazon start with books. We'll start with 3D printing, CNC, but ultimately it should be an infinite type uh, supply and demand platform. That's, that's where we want to go. For sure. Well, yeah, super cool to hear about the kind of evolution of the, the vision from specifically manufacturing to also include kind of like a, a human labor type marketplace or deepen as well. It's an awesome, I think, angle to include and something that the market is signaling to you that like it needs. And it sounds like you guys are going to be willing to fulfill that. So super interesting. Um, that's all I have for you today, but thanks Thank very for much for joining us here. For sure. Yep. Thank thanks for listening to the Proof of Coverage podcast. We post new episodes Mondays and Wednesdays, interviewing the best deepen and crypto founders out there. If you like this episode, follow us on Twitter at Coverage Proved and all other platforms, including YouTube and Spotify at Proof of Coverage Podcast. Thank you.